Okay, let's begin this uh, <clears throat> first lecture uh, of a full 15 week semester course on intermediate nuclear engineering uh, covering neutron diffusion, neutron transport, and in the larger sense of uh, transport and diffusion of radiation, meaning uh, photon transport and uh, <clears throat> uh, extended to Monte Carlo simulation. So this is a course that uh, covers all three uh, methods and uh, most of the courses that are taught in universities do not have a unified approach of teaching uh, the three uh, methods, uh, which are essentially two methodologies. <clears throat> the course content is introduction to nuclear engineering, uh, mathematical foundations, neutron diffusion, neutron transport, Monte Carlo method, Monte Carlo simulation, computer codes, which are widely used, variational methods, applications in fixed source and in multiplying systems. In the first week, I hope to take you through three lectures uh, and to cover nu nuclear radiation, uh, the basic nuclear physics, uh, flux, current, nuclear data and reaction rates, uh, an overview of nuclear reactors, definition of criticality, and how uh, radiation is detected, and what are the factors, what is the purpose of radiation shielding, and how do we achieve radiation shielding. My name and address are over here, and uh, my cell number, uh, personal email, official email, and my personal website. So you're welcome to send any questions, discuss anything, I will try my best to answer questions. So let's begin with the, an introduction to nuclear engineering and look at the uh, basic concepts in <clears throat> the nuclear physics, which translate into technology. And when, when science and technology combine, when you design something, then that whole area we call nuclear engineering. <clears throat> Now, some basic nuclear physics, uh, the picture of an atom is of a central dense nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Now, inside the dense nucleus, we've got neutrons and protons with a very small rest mass, mn, the mass of a neutron at rest is 1.67482 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. <clears throat> and the mass of a proton MP is 1.67252 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now these are very, very small units. So we talk of uh, an atomic mass unit written as 1U, which is 1 12th of the mass of an unbounded carbon 12 atom. <clears throat> so if you talk in terms of atomic mass units, the mass of a neutron is 1.008665 units. The mass of a proton is slightly less at 1.6725, sorry, 1.007277 atomic mass units. And the rest mass of an electron is about a thousand times less than that of a proton. <clears throat> now, you might be thinking that how do protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which, are, which have no charge, how do they live together in, a, in, a, in the nucleus? And that is made possible by a binding energy. They pair up because they've got opposite spins and they have a negative energy which is holding them together. So if you look at the nucle nu nucleons separately, for example, there are Z protons, each of mass MP. There are capital N neutrons, each of mass MN, and you convert them to an equivalent energy, so MC squared. And the nuclear mass energy, when things are together, so it's mnc squared. Now let's do this calculation for a tritium nucleus. You know that hydrogen has three isotopes, 1h1, 1h2, 1h3. 1h3 has one proton and two neutrons. So if you calculate their energy separately, you get 2817.9318825 million electrons. <clears throat> if you look at it as a whole, <coughs> then its <coughs> mass is 3.016050 atomic mass units, and this comes to 2809.450575 million electron volts. 
there's a difference between these two. When you put them together, their energy equivalence is less than what it is when they're separate. <clears throat> so where is the 8.4813 MeV? Where is that gone? So that's gone in holding them together. And if you divide that number by three, because there are three nucleons, one plus one proton and two neutrons, then it comes to a figure of 2.81 MeV per nucleon. <clears throat> so this number you'll find of, uh, of uh, 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 nuclei in the periodic table. And <clears throat> now these nuclei, uh, just like leaving a marble on a table, if you push it to the edge, it's not going to stay at the edge, it will fall down to the ground because it, everything likes to come down to the ground state. <clears throat> so just like uh, physical objects which we can see, nuclei also have excited states and they like to come down to their ground state and they do that by rearranging themselves. So for example, a nucleus could decay uh, <clears throat> by emitting alpha, beta, or gamma radiation from inside the nucleus. <clears throat> and it would like to come into a better arrangement. Now, those nuclei which have even even number of uh, protons and neutrons <coughs> are stable. <clears throat> and those which do not, they break up, they decay more readily. So, uh, these neutrons can have a number of reactions with nuclei, uh, several reactions. For example, a neutron can go and collide and an alpha particle could come out. We call that an N-alpha reaction. It could be absorbed and a gamma could come out. You don't see anything coming out except energy. So that's called a radiative capture. So there are so many possible, possible nuclear reactions which can take place. One important one is what we call nuclear fission, which is the breaking up of heavy nuclei into lighter nuclei. And on the other end is fusion, nuclear fusion, where light nuclei combine with each other. And so fission and fusion are energy producing reactions. Both of these reactions move the system towards an increase in the binding energy per nucleon and they are accompanied by the release of energy upon which we have our fission reactors. Over 430 nuclear fission reactors in the world are operating on this principle. And hopefully someday we'll also have nuclear fusion reactors like the sun. <clears throat> we'll have them in controlled lab environments and we'll be producing 1000 megawatts. So the experiment right now going on is ITER ITER .org. you can get all the sites on that, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. <clears throat> now exercise 1.1 is for you. You can try this. The idea is that you get an estimate on how big or how small things are. Now remember Avogadro's number. This says that in a gram atom, a gram atom is that much of an atom which weighs its atomic weight. So 12 grams of carbon is what we would call one gram atom. And Avogadro's number says that 12 grams of atom will have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms in it. Now, water is a molecule. So when you talk of molecules, you don't talk of gram atom, you talk of a gram molecule or a gram mole. And again, Avogadro's number applies there that water, H2O, there would be 6.022, 10 to the 23 molecules of water in a gram mole of water. So in this exercise, uh, what I'm asking you is that estimate the diameter of a carbon atom, given its density, that make a cube of one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. And let's say it weighs 2.26 grams. So there are Avogadro's number of atoms so you can calculate the mass of the, um, of the atoms. And uh, you know the mass of the atoms, it's uh, so many grams per cubic centimeter. And 6.022, 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon weigh this much. 
So you can get the size of one atom of carbon by assuming a packing fraction. They're not all tightly packed with each other. There must be some space in between. So let's say the packing fraction is epsilon, some number between zero and one. Uh, just use anything what you think is right. Calculate, estimate the diameter of a carbon atom, check the number in books. And from there, you can get some idea of the packing fraction. Let's move now to nuclear radiation. <clears throat> because nuclear engineering uh, is all about nuclear radiation. What is nuclear radiation? Now, this is a broad term. It's used for any form of particles or electromagnetic energy, any form of particles or electromagnetic energy, which is emitted from nuclei or from atoms, either spontaneously during their adjustments into stable ground states or after activation by us, by bombarding them, for example, by neutrons, and you take them to a state where they start emitting radiation. So you could classify it as spontaneous emission or induced emission. <clears throat> Now, look at one of these reactions, how in the old days, uh, Chadwick made, uh, saw neutrons. <clears throat> well, what they did was that they fired uh, alphas coming out of heavy uh, elements such as radium, uh, polonium, and they struck the uh, at atoms of beryllium with alpha particles and uh, if you or, or they struck it with uranium also and they saw <clears throat> that you get uh, a number of uh, different reactions. Now this particular one results in carbon 13 which can branch off into one of these four reactions A, B, C, D I've labeled them. One gives you B512 plus a proton uses energy, which means that it's an endothermic reaction. Now those which give out energy are called exothermic reactions. So these three that you see here give out energy. So this one, for example, gives out C612, a carbon atom. It gives out a neutron. It gives out a gamma ray with energy 4.4 million electron volts, and you get energy out of it of 1.2 mm. Now. The good thing about nuclear radiations is good if you want to use them for, for example, seeing the crack in an old bridge. So it's penetrating radiation, it has high energy, and due to the penetration, penetration power, they can be useful for several industrial applications. Now, less energetic radiations, which come from the orbital electrons when they're de-exciting from their excited states, those are called X-rays as opposed to gamma rays, which come out of nuclei. Now, X-rays, we're all familiar. We go to a hospital, we stand in front of an X-ray machine, and we have a, a little uh, plastic kind of sheet behind us. So if there's a fracture in, our, in any of our bones, so the X-ray goes through there, and an image is made at the back from which the doctor can tell whether you have no, no fracture or a hairline fracture or a serious fracture. <clears throat> Now, so if you look at the Handbook of Nuclear Engineering edited by Kakuchi, 2010, you'll see that this term radiation is used for both atomic and nuclear radiation. Nuclear radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, and neutrons come out, typically with energies of MeV, and X-rays come out with KeV, kilo electron volts. So, that's what is meant by radiation. Now, how harmful is radiation? <clears throat> well, it depends on so many things. What is the strength of the radiation? What is the nature of the radiation? Which organ in your body is it going to, is it, is it going to damage? So <clears throat> first of all, let's put some units and numbers. So neutrons and photons, like charged particles, they are radiations that have an effect on humans, animals, living organisms, as well as on materials. 
and a central objective of all nuclear engineering design is to determine the radiation levels at facilities where people working there are exposed to neutrons, photons, and all electromagnetic radiations. So let's look at three quantities, the absorbed dose, the equivalent dose, and the effective dose. So absorbed dose D, we use an SI unit of gray. Gray is just a joule of energy per kilogram. And in the old units, we used to talk of ergs and grams. So one gray is related in the old literature it's equal, it's equal to 100 grams. Rad was the unit of absorbed dose, which we used to use uh, many years back. Uh, today's unit is the gray. Now, similarly, the unit of Röntgen R has been used to represent the exposure of radiation that results in the generation of one electrostatic unit of charge in one cubic centimeter of air at standard temperature and pressure. 1 Röntgen, 1 R is equal to 2.58 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. So the exposure of 1 coulomb per kilogram is equivalent to uh, quite a bit of energy, 33.8 joules per kilogram or 33.8 grain. Now you know what a joule is. A joule is a newton meter. <clears throat> if you apply a force of 1 newton and something moves by 1 meter, then you say that the energy that you've used is one joule. But atoms and radiations are tiny things, so we don't measure their energy in terms of joules. We measure their things in terms of electron volts. Remember, one electron volt is a very, very small amount of energy. It is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is an example which I want you to do yourself that uh, sorry, this is an example. I'll take you through it. If dry, dry air with an ionization energy I of 34 electron volts per ion pair, which means in this room <clears throat> there are ion pairs, air is not charged, otherwise you'll be getting currents. So if you want to ionize air, so you have to deposit energy in there. So you can ionize it by firing any radiation in a room. It will ionize the air. <clears throat> if it has sufficiently high energy. <clears throat> so you can convert into ion uh, pairs. And so you can see that if you're talking of an exposure of one R, then the absorbed dose is the energy multiplied by the, uh, the uh, ionization energy. Okay. So if the conversion factor of one R is so many uh, coulombs per kilogram, and this is the electron volts needed per ion pair, <clears throat> the 34 joules per coulomb. Multiply this by coulombs per kilogram, then you'll get joules per kilogram. So this gives you 0 0.008772 joules per kilogram, a small number. Uh, it's 8.772 milligrams. <clears throat> now, as I said, let's look at the type of radiation, the response of a tissue in our body to that radiation. So let's look at the equivalent dose H. Now, the absorbed dose which I told you is just a joule per kilogram. But that doesn't say anything about how much damage has it caused on the lungs or the kidneys or the brain or the eyes of a person. So we would like to convert that into an equivalent dose. Now equivalent dose, the first thing we do is we see which kind of radiation was it. So if it was betas and gammas radiation, so we'll assign it a quality factor of one and we'll say that the absorbed dose and the equivalent dose are the same. So if you look over here, so we've got a formula the equivalent dose is WR, which is a radiation weighting factor, multiplied by the dose to the tissue T. So the uh, neutrons, which are highly penetrating, they can have a very high quality factor. Depending on the energy, it can go up to 20 ohms. Now, the equivalent dose depends on the rate of energy deposition of a radiation as it collides with the host material 
in its interactions. So let's take an example over here. Now let's look at example 1.2. Let's say that a person is sitting and he is being bombarded by an X-ray and by energetic neutrons. So the X-rays have a quality factor, which we say is WR, and this is one. Neutrons have 10. So let's say that he got uh, one rand. So if you multiply one by the quality factor, you get the equivalent rows of one rem. And here it's uh, 10 is the quality factor. You multiply it by 0.2, so you get two rems. Now, similarly for skin, uh, it's two rads and uh, multiply by the quality factor. For x-rays, two times one is two, point two times 10 is two. Okay, <clears throat> so, so from here, what you get is for one rad, you get the equivalent dose to the lungs and to the skin gives you three REMs. Now, REM is, uh, is uh, a smaller quantity, so the bigger thing is a sievert. So this gives 0 0.03 sieverts. Similarly, for the skin, you can, so that was for the lungs due to both the radiations. This is to the skin from both the radiations. So in the end, you add these two together and you get seven REMs. Now, when you visit a hospital and get a single X-ray of your chest or your abdomen or your pelvis, then this is the equivalent dose that you get. 10 for a usual chest X-ray, 60 for the stomach, 70 milliram for a full body CT. And while a, while a full body CT scan would give you one REM. Now the effective dose. Effective dose, every organ reacts differently. And we talk about a stochastic health risk. Now the word stochastic means a probabilistic. Just like three plus four is seven, if you add two numbers which are probabilistic, then the answer will not be seven. It will be also uncertain. It will have a mean value and a variance. So uh, it's not necessary that a tissue would behave in a deterministic sense. So what we do is to find the effective dose, we represent the tissue specific response and we estimate a stochastic health risk. We still need a, to quantify it, we need to give it a number. So we look at the various tissues, the breast, lung, bone surfaces, skin, other organs. Now these are the weighting factors given in the different publications of ICRP, the International Commission for Radiological Protection. The units of effective dose are also REMS. So the overall effective dose <clears throat> for the problem that we did was that we multiplied by the factor of the lungs. For example, you see for the lungs over here, the number is 0 0.12. And for this, for skin, the number is 0 0.01. So this is the effectiveness that you see on your organs of 0.4 red. Now, if you're talking of a time-dependent radiation dose, then all the units above that I uh, went through, the dose, the equivalence, and the exposure. So we, uh, the dot on top of that means that they are per unit time. Now let's look at the prescribed safety limits. How much is permissible and beyond how much is dangerous? So the International Commission on Radiological Protection, ICRP, and the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, USNRC, <clears throat> they have stipulated standards. So they say that the occupational dose limits for adults, occupational, people working in nuclear facilities, the total effective dose equivalent limit is set at five REMs, 0 0.05 uh, sieverts. Now this is what you can receive in a year. So the occupational dose, annual dose limit. Okay, so that's the occupational annual dose limit for adults is five REMs. And if you look at the US NRC 
the code for federal regulations is number 10 and they say that all individuals who in the course of their empl employment are likely to receive a dose of more than 100 milligrams in other words 0.1 rem in a year must receive adequate training to protect themselves against radiation so what are the numbers so we've seen one number is five rems so it has been observed that less than five rems you do not have any serious radiation effects beyond this limit changes in blood chemistry have been observed at 70 rems a person begins to vomit and that is followed by hair loss by diarrhea and by bleeding through hemorrhaging at about 100 rems now possible death can take place within two months if you get a radiation dose more than 400 grams. So this is lethal. And persons who receive doses exceeding 5,000 grams in a nuclear blast or something, 50 sieverts would die within few hours of exposure, probably by the failure of the central nervous system. So radiation is a dangerous thing. And we have to take precautions. Now, sitting at home, we are being constantly bombarded by natural background radiation. It's here. It's everywhere. It's in your room. It's in your house. It's everywhere. And we are getting about 2 millirems per day. Okay, so this is the amount that we are receiving, whether you like it or not. Now, for those working in uh, nuclear facilities, uh, they, uh, they are, of course, at much uh, bigger risk. And uh, the spontaneous sources that you could find in labs are uh, curium CM242, CM244, plutonium 238. This is the one being used in the Mars lander. Uh, the car that is going to go around, even in the past, plutonium-238 has been used because it emits radiation and it produces heat in that decay. That heat is converted into uh, electricity and electrical power is used to uh, run the diagnostics and to provide power to the car that's going to move the, uh, on, on the Martian surface. <clears throat> Now, another very powerful neutron source is Californium-252. So Chadwick was the first person at the University of, the first person in the world in 1932, where at the University of Cambridge, he uh, came up with uh, an understanding that this is a neutron which has come out from the bombardment of alpha particles. Uh, <clears throat> Well, the experiment was that either is it negatively charged or is it positively charged? A neutron carries no charge with it, so it neither deflected to the left or to the right. So many people, especially in France, thought it was something like a gamma ray. But Chadwick was the first to give the right uh, thinking to this, and he got his Nobel Prize in 1932 for his uh, discovery of the neutron. So as I said, neutrons undergo many reactions. The opposite of uh, neutron striking something is the neutron creation. For example, if in a photoneutron reaction, you can fire photons, uh, gammas, and produce neutrons. So this therapy is also used in the, in the imaging of organs such as the thyroid, bones, heart, liver. It is also used for the treatment of cancer in organs such as the lungs, breast, colon, rectum, prostate, stomach, liver, etc. So uh, nuclear radiation can go and kill the cancerous tissue cells by damaging their DNA and uh, it can also be used externally. So externally uh, means to fire a radiation on a person from a distance and to 
implant seeds inside a person is called short distance or brachytherapy. Uh, both are used in hospitals and you can deliver uh, high do doses to kill tumor, typically 60 to 80 grays, which is 6,000 to 8,000 rads would be necessary to kill cancer cells. Now, lots of radioisotopes are used routinely, technetium, iodine, palladium, iridium, cesium, cobalt, the famous cobalt knife. So you can go through low dose rate sources and high dose rate sources also. If you are standing near a nuclear fission reactor, then you get lots of fast neutrons coming out of it. Fast neutron is something whose energy is in the MeV, the million electron volt uh, range. So uh, a reactor that's, let's say, operating at 1000 megawatt is producing 10 to the 15. So because it produces about 10 to the 12 neutrons per megawatt. And you can also produce uh, neutrons as in the old days, it was through Van de Graaff generators, Cockroft Walton generators. They had been used uh, uh, to produce neutrons. These days, if you were to use a neutron source for diagnostics of a bridge, you would use a very small, intense, and portable neutron generator, uh, which might be producing neutrons from nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, as I mentioned earlier, which takes place uh, between isotopes of hydrogen, such as deuterium, deuterium, and deuterium tritium. You'll see that they, these reactions take place at millions of degrees Celsius, uh, and these are the reactions of the sun and the stars. Now I want to show you uh, two, new, two uh, neutron sources. So let's see that uh, how good or how bad, how intense are they. Now, if you look at Californium 252, which is a very intense neutron source, it produces, uh, gives about 2.2 to 2.3 times 10 to the 3 rems meter square per gram per hour, so that a 25 microgram source with just a little bit of powder in your hands, that would emit 57.5 million neutrons per second. And if you stand one meter away from it in air, it would give you about 55 to 57 millirems per hour, which means that in about 20 hours, it would give you uh, 1,000 millirems, which is one rem. So in about uh, 100 hours, it would give you five rems, uh, which is what the permissible annual uh, dose is, the maximum permissible. Now, another source is americium beryllium. We call it an MB source. And if you look at uh, the spectrum, you see that the blue one is Californium 252. It has a most probable energy over here, which is about 0 0.7 million electron volts. It has an average energy obtained by averaging over the blue uh, curve. The average energy of neutrons coming out of Californium 252 is 2.1 MeV. Now, on the other hand, the red uh, lines, the, the red figure is americium beryllium, which you can see as a spectrum, which gives you more, for example, 15% at higher than 5 MeV, whereas this gives you less than 5%. So uh, different sources are used for different purposes. Now, the neutron yield uh, per Curie, you look at the specific activity, Curie is a very large number of Becquerels. Now Becquerel BQ is a disintegration per second. And Curie is uh, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 uh, uh, disintegrations per second. So a Curie is a very big number. So the neutrons per second per Curie coming out is 4.4 billion. So that's a lot of neutrons coming out at this average energy and this maximum energy. So the dose, if you compare the doses, so much more coming out of Californium 252. So you can do all these calculations and see how long can you stand in front of a Californium source, how long can you stand in front of any source. Okay. Now, Let's come to a 
quantity, which is uh, a central quantity in nuclear engineering, and that is called neutron flux. Now, neutron flux is uh, written as phi as a function of position, energy, the direction of travel of a neutron, omega solid angle, and the time at which it's traveling. So position in Cartesian geometry is x, y, z, which is three. Then energy is one, so three plus one is four variables. Solid angle is orthogonal and azimuthal, so these are two angles. So three plus one, four, plus two, six, plus one, seven variables. So the neutron flux is a function of seven variables. Now that complicates things because when you want to find anything in a nuclear reactor, how many fissions are taking place, how many neutrons are leaking from your reactor, then you have to find the flux or the current uh, in or around the nuclear reactor. <clears throat> so flux is, if you put a paper in front of a radiation and count the uh, crossings, when it's 90 degrees to the radiation, we call that flux. So flux is small n times the speed. So small n is the number of neutrons per unit volume, which means neutrons per cubic centimeter, multiplied by the neutron speed. So the units of flux are neutrons per centimeter square per second. Okay, so this is a very central, this is a central quantity in nuclear engineering. Now, is a neutron stable? Can it live forever or does it die? So this is what has been found that once a nucleus, once a neutron is outside a nucleus, it is unstable, it decays, it has a mean lifetime of just under 15 minutes, 881.5 plus or minus 1.5 seconds. It undergoes beta decay. Now remember I told you beta is like a negatively charged electron, except that it does not come from the orbital electrons, it comes from inside the nucleus. So a neutron decays into a beta decay and into uh, a proton because charge has to be conserved. Uh, an electron and uh, an antineutrino. Now when I take the word antineutrino, neutrino, then Enrico Fermi comes to mind. He was a brilliant physicist come engineer, died very young. But if you look at the number of papers, so neutrino was something which was his forte and uh, he's the person who named it and, uh, and found its existence and its many of its characteristics. So neutron flux is what we'll be using a lot in this course. Now I leave you uh, to complete this lecture today with an exercise that if you're standing around a five megawatt research reactor, you know, a research reactor does not produce power. And uh, let's say that the flux is 10 to the 14 neutrons per centimeter square per second. So estimate the neutron density using this formula. Now the key word over here is thermal flux, that neutrons are in thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium means an energy of 0 0.025 electron volts. So I'll end the lecture over here and uh, till we meet again for the second lecture. That's all for today. Thank you.